Hey guys, welcome back to Ranger Survival and Fieldcraft. I'm Andrew, and what I have for you today is Hunter Survival. Stand by. All right, welcome back. So, out here hunting, a blizzard came through just recently. Blanketed the area with snow, and winter is here in full force. Single digits, below zero at nighttime, never above freezing during the day, and usually a strong wind from the south or north, which makes it a huge factor surviving out here in the open plains. Now, I'm out here with my survival kit. I always have a survival kit tailored to my environment and then for my purposes. So I have my survival kit plus a few items in here for the purposes of large game hunting and then a rations pack for food if I get stranded overnight. And then everything you see on me. As part of my planning, I leave a map and a detailed plan back at the ranch with people so they know where I'm going and what time to expect me back and then what to do if I don't show up on time. Always leave a map with detailed instructions with somebody in the rear to let them know where you're going, who you're going with, and what time to expect you back, and then what to do if you don't show up on time. So we have that contingency plan in place. I have all of my gear with me, ready to go in the event that I'm stranded out here and then to keep me warm while I'm hunting. So let's go over clothing really quick. And for my clothing, my base layer is going to be wool socks and moisture wicking underwear and t-shirt. On top of that, I have polypropylene thins or skinnies as I like to call them. Polypropylene is an excellent fabric for moisture wicking and staying warm. On top of that, I have my waffle bottoms and waffle tops on. Pro tip, take your waffle bottoms or your thermal pants if you want. And what I like to do is go to a sewing shop, have them split the sides, and stitch in Velcro. That way I can take those pants off and on very easily without having to remove my boots or remove my top layer. My top layer, I have my heavy duty hunting pants and jacket on. With my hunting pants and jacket, the, th the thick ones I have on top, I place different survival items in my pockets, making it almost like an SAS smock, if you will. Fire lighting implements, cell phone, knives, and different things to stay warm and get a fire going in the event I'm without my survival kit and it's just what I have on me. So I place different survival items in my body and still distribute those things through my pants and then my jacket. And then on top of that, I have my shooter gloves and then I have thick heavy gloves. And then I've got my hat. I've got a thin camouflage snow layer for hunting, I've got my hunting harness, my tree stand harness, and then I've got my binos, I've got my deer call, my headlamp, and everything ready to go, and I'm set up for hunting once I get to my tree stand. All right, so in this situation, the first thing I wanna do is find a good shelter location. I have materials in here to help me affect shelter. If I didn't, I'd be finding the place with the tallest, thickest grass, and using that with a lot of overhead cover and creating a debris bed and debris shelter to keep me warm overnight along with a fire. Now what I wanna do is find a shelter location. For shelter, we go with the five W's. I wanna find a place with wood for fuel for fire. Without widow makers, big large trees that fall on top of people. I wanna find a place near water or a water source. I've got plenty of snow around me. I can melt snow. and drink that throughout the night. I want to find a place out of the wind. We have a wind coming from the north and I think it's supposed to maintain uh, around a nine mile per hour wind coming from north to south. So I want to find a place out of that wind and somewhere in cover so I can avoid that wind. And then I want to be somewhere away from wildlife. We do have a lot of deer, we have a lot of pheasants, we also have a lot of coyotes, and there are mountain lions out here. So I want to be somewhere away off of game trails and away from those places where animals like to habitat. All right, let's go find a shelter location. 
All right, guys, now before I get into my shelter location right over here, let's go over the Colder acronym very quickly. The Colder acronym, C-O-L-D-E-R, is a memory tool to help us remember how to operate in a cold environment. The cold and snow adds another layer of difficulty to any survival situation. Now, colder, the first letter C, means keep yourself clean. Dirt, sweat, and mildew are gonna break down your clothing. Your clothing is your first line of defense against the cold. O, O stands for avoid overheating. You sweat out here, you die. L stands for layered, dress in layers like I've just shown you. D, dry, keep yourself dry as possible. E stands for examine, examine your clothing. The last letter R stands for repair. And that means repair your clothing as soon as you find an issue with it. This spot looks like it'll do us fine. There are dead branches hanging off of this tree. We can pull those down to eliminate the probability of them falling on us during the night. The wind isn't supposed to pick up over the night and the snow is actually gonna stop from the weather report the last time I saw it. So the spot should be good for us. We just wanna make sure a lot of these dead dry branches are pulled down and we can use them for our fire tonight. So the first thing we're gonna do, inspect this area really quick and then start collecting our fuel and fire is gonna be our first priority. Once we get that fire going, we have some place we can come back and warm up to if we need to. And then from there, we can build our shelter and get ready to settle in for the night. There's a lot of fuel in this tree and stuff I've already just pulled off that you guys have seen me throw and kick away from the spot where I'm gonna to sleep tonight. My first priority is to get that fire going. That fire gives me first something to come back to, warm myself while I'm pulling more fuel down and getting my shelter set up or if I'm off collecting water. Next, it gives me a signal for anyone looking for me. And then it'll keep predators and animals away from my camping location. But I want to have that fire built first so I can put up a signal if I need to and then have a place to warm up and start boiling water to keep myself hydrated. Going with the long fire tonight. Long fire is best for this type of situation. It's going to warm up the entire length of my shelter. We're going to do a Morse Kohansky super shelter. So that long fire is going to maximize the radiant heat that gets through that polyethylene sheath reflected off the mylar blanket on the back side and then trapped against that polyethylene sheath to give me a lot of warmth inside that shelter. With a long fire, I already got my logs down on the ground as a base layer with a piece of bark right on top that I'm going to use as platform to start the fire. I just need to collect a lot of these smalls that will burn fast and quickly and give me a lot of heat to warm up the other branches and deadfall that I've collected, drying them out and then igniting those branches, feeding that long fire and the fire consuming from the inside out. To start, I want to make sure that I look above me right beneath my fire to make sure there's no snow or large snow accumulated above me that could drop on my fire and put that entire thing out. I've got a small Altoids tin here with cotton balls and Vaseline for tinder and then my six inch ferro rod. Now the same rule applies once the flames get up above the 
fuel that you just put on, you can add more fuel onto that. I'm going to add it lengthwise to continue to feed that fire so that it eats from the inside out. All right, our fire is going, but one point, now that we have a fire going, it's sustainable. Let's talk about that colder acronym again. I want to remain clean. I don't want to overheat. I'm dressed and layered, still good, relatively dry. One of the things I don't want to do is if I'm covered in snow is to come stand next to this fire. That snow is going to melt and get your clothing wet and get you cold. And you have to stay next to the fire longer to dry out all your clothing. So before I ever come back to the fire, what I want to do is dust myself off to make sure I don't have snow on me that could melt while I'm standing next to the fire and warm it back up. One thing I have in my kit that I've added for the environment that I'm in is a good forest axe. A good forest axe will help me chop down all that dead wood that's hanging up and process it into smaller pieces so I can add it onto my fire and increase the length of my fire and get more fuel on. All right, guys, I'm already overheating. Last thing I want to do is sweat on these inner layers and then have that moisture collect and lower my body temperature. Out here on the open plains in the middle of winter, it's a bad deal. All right, while I'm out getting fuel for the fire, I'm going to get my bedding. This prairie grass is going to be my bedding. I want at least minimum four inches of compressed debris on the floor. That way I avoid losing body heat through conduction to the ground. The ground is freezing. There are some leaves underneath the snow, but I want to have a good bed to lay on tonight. So I'm going to collect up a lot of this grass. What you guys saw me do was take the grass leaning against the dead branches and the tree right here. A lot of the times this grass is going to grow up against those branches during the spring and summer months as we hit fall and winter. The branches die on that tree and so does this grass, making it easier for us to actually harvest and take away instead of trying to pull up everything from the frozen ground. Now the cornfields and the large open prairies, if you're exposed in the open land, move to cover into the low ground where we have trees and a lot of the times all the resources we need to survive the night are going to be right around us. Too easy. For the shelter tonight that we're going to use, it's going to be that grabber space blanket as our backdrop. I got my quick deploy ridge line here that I've already set up. And then I've got a polyethylene sheath or painter's cloth that's going to go over top of our shelter and seal everything off to give us that Morse Kohansky super shelter. Let's set it up. So we ran out of cordage to go around the tree here for a trucker's hitch. These trees are just too wide in diameter and then too far apart to actually get a regular trucker's hitch. However, I do have a green branch right here that I can just do the same trucker's hitch on. I'm not too worried about it being that there's not that high of a wind today. It's not going to disrupt our shelter or blow it away once we stake it all off. I'm not too worried about that. I'm down in cover. The wind isn't going to affect it. So I feel pretty confident just using this green branch coming out of the side of the tree here to attach for our trucker hitch and then continue with our shelter construction.
We've got the polyethylene sheath. That's the next step in the shelter construction right now. We've got our lean-to with our grabber space blanket, our browse bed underneath, approximately four to six inches of compressed debris on the floor, keeping us insulated from the ground so we don't lose heat through conduction to the cold, cold ground. But now we've got our polyethylene sheath. We're going to drape this over top of our shelter. There's a log on the back side and a log on the front side. We'll roll the ends of the polyethylene sheath around those logs to hold them in place so it doesn't get taken away by the wind. And then we'll take out some Gorilla Tape. We're going to tape the front of our shelter here with the polyethylene, the two sides. We'll tape them together down the center and closing the front of our shelter. Then we'll do the same thing on the back side of the shelter. We can always unroll one of the logs, get some slack, and then climb into the shelter and then roll it back on ourselves tonight once we finally go to bed. But let's go ahead and get this done. We got just enough slack with the polyethylene sheath here to use our Gorilla Tape to tape this up. We got the shelter up. Major priorities of survival, fire for warmth, signaling, cooking, melting snow, all the good stuff shelter we got up we're ready to go for the night i can definitely feel the effects of doing a lot of work in a cold environment i'm having trouble speaking a little bit and then kind of losing track of my words so it's good to come out here and actually kind of feel that and get some training under those conditions clothes are about dry i'm gonna put those back on here shortly I'm gonna make one more trip around the area to collect up that last bit of big fuel for our fire to last throughout the night. And then once I'm done with that, come back to the fire here and it'll be chow time. <sighs> Creek is frozen solid, but I have a small cache in this area just for these occasions. And I was able to bag a small hair for dinner chow. Let's go cook this guy up. All right guys, so Saved you the gory part of cleaning that rabbit that we shot down by the creek. So I'm just going to cook up some of the rabbit right now and then I'm going to store the rest for later. One of the methods for storing an animal during winter season or in arctic climates is by burying portions of the animal in snow. Now before you go burying an animal in snow or any game that you catch in snow, you always want to cut up that animal into meal sized portions. That way in the future you're not trying to saw a portion of the animal off to cook for a meal. That meal is already ready for you. You want to mark the spot where you bury the animal. So you can come back to it later. So one method is by burying the animal. So I'm just going to cook this guy for dinner here. One thing to be cautious of during winter climates and during winter survival is something called rabbit starvation. Rabbit starvation is just a diet consisting of high protein where you're not getting enough fat in your diet to maintain cellular function. So one of the things I do is I like to pack a rations pack and I like to have that rations pack contain high calorie, high fat foods for just such climates so I can maintain fat intake if I happen to get an animal like this rabbit and still supplement a lot of the nutritional value of fat with other items along with this rabbit.
Sorry guys, my boots are cold and a little bit sweaty on the inside. These are waterproof boots with 1200 grams of insulate, but they get sweaty inside from all the work I've been doing. So I'm gonna change socks to help keep my feet dry and then dry out my dirty socks over the fire. That's nice. Another advantage to having the Velcro down the sides of your waffle bottoms. thing we can do to avoid frozen water in the morning for our coffee we can take our canteen tighten down the lid and then turn it upside down put it inside of our canteen pouch and what that does is the water now is resting on the top of the canteen further down and the top of the water is somewhere near the bottom of the canteen that water that's at the bottom of the canteen now with the air pocket in here will freeze first before the water down near the lid freezes what that means is that in the morning, when we take our canteen out and turn it upside down, we will have ice at the bottom of our canteen and free-flowing water at the top of our canteen. So we can unscrew this, put it in our canteen cup, and warm it up for our morning cup of coffee. So pro tip, turn your canteen upside down at night to let the water freeze at the bottom of your canteen so you have free-flowing water and can get your lid off your canteen in the morning for your hot cup of coffee. All right guys, so I think that does it for this evening. I'm gonna enjoy this hot cocoa and get a little bit more fuel for the fire, add it on, and then climb it to my shelter to bed down for the evening. But I will see you guys bright and early in the morning. Take it easy. Fire is going pretty well outside. It's dying down just a little bit. I had to climb out and move the fire away from the shelter a little bit because it's getting a little too warm in here. Uh, which is nice. I'd rather have it too warm than not warm enough. I'd say it's got to be around 60 degrees inside the shelter right now. I'm just in my t-shirt and my pants and doing just fine laying on top of my browse bed. But the Morskohansky Super Shelter is definitely a game changer. Highly recommend y'all try it out. But time to get a little bit more rack and then I'll see you guys in the morning. All right. Good night. First order of business is a large hot cup of coffee. Pheasants are out in full force this morning. All right, so while my water's doing its thing, let's talk about the night. Shelter held up pretty well. You can see there's damage along the uh, shelter that I fixed haphazardly with a little bit of duct tape. The environment, no change from yesterday evening when we started our video. The only thing that really changed was the weather. So we had a north wind and it fed the fire pretty well. We had cloud cover and that cloud cover held in a lot of the ambient temperature. The temperature at night, last night, up until about three or four in the morning was in the mid teens. It was still pretty cold, but not bad. 
well, around 3 or 4 a.m., the clouds went away, the moon and the stars came out, and the temperature plummeted into single digits. The most tedious part of last night was getting into and out of the shelter to feed the fire. The materials that we have around here, a lot of it, the dead standing dry material is already going through its decay process, so a lot of it is punk. A lot of it is punk wood that's already decaying. And so when we add that to the fire, that stuff tends to burn very quickly. You'll notice that we went through all of the fuel, uh, save a few twigs and some bark and maybe thumb size pieces of fuel that were left over from the larger material that we collected yesterday. The reason being is a lot of that fuel burned up very quickly. I would get about an hour or so of good temperature inside the shelter, about 60 degrees, 65 degrees inside the shelter. I was able to warm up, get about an hour or so of sleep, and the temperature would go down. I'd wake up, have to get out of the shelter, and feed the fire again. And it wasn't until about 3 or 4 in the morning that I ran out of the larger stuff of fuel, and I had to go around here and collect up a lot of dead standing material with my axe to uh, bring back here and then put on the fire. So last night we had chow really quick throughout the night, made different hot liquids, tea and hot cocoa to drink, stay warm before I got back into the shelter and then warmed up again and got a little bit of rack time. Overall, the night was a success. The damage to the shelter that you guys see was due to the fact that the cloud cover left and the wind coming from the north changed direction on us. It started coming from the north and then shifted directly west, blowing right into our shelter. So a lot of the embers that were kicked up uh, in the fire landed on our shelter. A lot of the damage to the tarp itself or to the polyethylene sheet is just a small pinprick size from smaller embers landing on the polyethylene, melting it quickly before that ember cooled out. But the shelter with browse bed with the thermal blanket behind and then the polyethylene sheet in front did work very well. At the beginning of the night before the clouds disappeared I was down to my t-shirt and then my pants inside the shelter and then as the night got colder and the clouds went away and the temperature dropped dramatically I put all my clothes back on. So a very cold night, a very long night but well worth it. Good training out here in the uh, cold out here in the open prairies. I'm gonna walk out. The sun is gonna be in full force, so I don't have any sunglasses, but a technique we can use to avoid snow blindness or the effects of long durations staring out into the reflection of the sun over the snow is by taking some of our hunter's uh, camo face paint and putting lines right underneath our eyes on the zygomatic arches of our face. Now, this technique isn't foolproof. To make it really foolproof, you have to have some sort of hat or cover over your eyes or over your brows. And then, along with that cover over your face, the camo face paint will help reduce the amount of glare from the sun off the snow into your eyes, reducing snow blindness. So, not 100%, but with the hat I have on, keeping it low over my eyes a little bit with the camel face paint underneath my eyes. It'll help reduce glare off of the snow from the sun and reduce the chances of snow blindness as I walk out today. One other thing we're gonna do, I don't know how many hunters are out in this area. I thought I heard snowmobiles last night, but I know a lot of people are moving, especially since a lot of game is moving right now. Pheasants are flying all over the place, and then deer are moving up and down these game trails to my west. So I'm gonna pull out a spare orange trash bag that I have uh, that I saved from uh, other video for my survival kit and unfold it a little bit. And I'm gonna attach that to the back of my backpack as I walk out today. so everybody can see that I've got orange on and that I'm moving through. So I'm gonna enjoy my coffee really quick. I'm gonna have a granola bar out of my rations pack and get ready to pack up camp and move out.
right, that does it for this video. Hunter Survival, too easy, Morskahansky Super Shelter, debris bed, and then a long fire to stay warm throughout the night. It was a long, cold night, but we made it. So I want to thank you guys for everything you do for me and for the channel, for your likes, your views, your subscriptions, your comments, your feedback, and your shares. And I'll be back with another awesome video as soon as I can, guys. Thanks. I almost forgot, a big thanks to all of you for 10,000 subscribers on this channel. So a big thanks for me to all of you, all of my subscribers. I can't believe 10,000 people, let alone a handful of people, would be interested in the survival videos that I make. But a big thanks from me to you guys. I appreciate all your support, and I'll keep those videos coming. Thank you.